All right, uh, next up we have uh, Seth Hilbrand giving a talk called Effective RF in Microwave Design with KiCad. Uh, Seth Hilbrand is a design engineer for the physics department of the University of California, Davis. He designs circuits to support research that looks for dark matter, tries to measure hidden photons, and measures physical processes in extreme environments. Previously, he worked on a high altitude ballooning and in electromagnetic warfare. He is currently one of the developers of the KiCad project. Please welcome them to the stage. Thanks. Um, so this is the second microwave talk from today. So uh, I'm going to caveat this by saying that my microwave spectrum is nowhere near the uh, frequency um, of the, the, the previous talks, which is good. And so I, I saw we had two as like, OK, well, I can kind of uh, uh, cater this talk to uh, be non-overlapping as much as possible. So hopefully there will still be some interesting things for you. So first of all, outline. So I'm going to talk about some, some of the RF constraints. Then I'm going, going to go into what we can do in KiCad today. And finally, I'm going to say, all right, well, maybe Maybe we'll, we'll talk just a little bit about what KiCad tomorrow is. Uh, and by tomorrow, it's, you know, when the code review finishes on a couple patches. So um, what KiCad tomorrow is going to be able to do. So quick overview of what this is. This is about a circuit that I was building for, specifically for a kind of dark matter search called um, uh, well, hidden photons or dark photons or something like that. Uh, essentially, what we uh, we really, really, really don't know what dark matter looks like, and so it could be anything. Um, you've probably heard a lot uh, in the news about you know kind of uh, dark matter called WIMPs, which are these large particles. This is not high frequency stuff. You you build a big, huge tank and you you put some liquid xenon or something in there, and then you hope to see something hitting those uh, hitting those large xenon atoms and giving off some light. And you see those with PMTs. That's not what this is. This is a different kind of dark matter where we say, well, what if, what if Maxwell, which we all know and love, is not the whole story? In other words, what if there is some component of the electric and magnetic field that goes in the direction of propagation instead of transverse? to the direction of propagation. And so in order to model this, we have to replace our Maxwellian equations, which, you know, I'm not sure they go back to your, you know, undergraduate years, um, with Proca equations, where you'll notice there's one more term in there, um, the M term on the right, where we have these hidden photons which have some non-zero mass, and so they have some uh, by uh, some also some characteristic frequency. We want to search for these. So we're looking for a frequency that we don't know what it is. But it's dark matter, so it's everywhere. And you probably remember from you know, popular science, dark matter is a lot more than regular matter, and so we see a lot of it. And we don't really see it because you know, we we can still see each other, and so it, it can't interact very much at all. So we need to get rid of all of the regular photons, and then whatever's left over, if we get rid of the regular photons in a certain frequency range, are going to be these dark photons. And we have to listen really, 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 really carefully. And so we build a big shielded box. And then inside that big shielded box, we put another big shielded box. And then inside that, Another big shielded box. You see where I'm going with this? We put another big shielded box. And we get all the way down to, uh, to a very low level, about, uh, about negative 112 decibels, dBm. Um, and then we scan over a very large frequency range. Because we don't know what it looks like. We don't know what its mass is, so we have to scan over a large frequency range, which is where this interesting design comes in. We want to be able to use the exact same circuit to look from 30 megahertz all the way up to 3 gigahertz. This is difficult, and we want to sample it with a Q of a million, which means that 
you need to have very, very, very narrow bins over that entire frequency range. So this is the circuit that, that, that I've built for this. This is uh, based around a digitizer, a, uh, a 5.6 giga sample per second digitizer um, that has four cores. Essentially what it does it, in order to get to this speed is it splits up the input and steps it out into uh, four different cores. that are in four different quadrants in the big chip you see in the center. And then well, you know, there are lots of little uh, tuned lines coming off from the outside that are all working at, um, uh, working at this, uh, this uh, high, uh, high frequency. And, and we, we send these out to an FPGA, which is a whole other project. But this board itself needs to be able to digitize that. And so we need to be very careful about what we do with the tracks when we're on that board. RF constraints in, in the uh, high RF, low microwave regime um, are not intuitive, at least not to me. And one of the non-intuitive things is that everything has a non-infinite impedance and everything has a non-zero impedance. There are no shorts and there are no opens. Everything has to be considered, so your spacing has to, be, uh, has to be carefully considered as well as all of the uh, characteristics, including um, what your track shape is. And so this, um, in order to determine how difficult this was going to be, um, I ran a couple simulations on everyone's favorite um, topic of controversy, um, rounded tracks versus, uh, versus chamfered tracks. Um, and uh, just to show you why we can't do straight tracks at this frequency. The plot here is supposed to be flat at 50 ohms. This is a 50 ohm input. And the model that you see on the left are two SMAs with a tuned track and a ground, and a ground plane underneath it. And this is, these are tuned to the proper parameters at uh, one gigahertz and, and below. And so, because we have to scan for this project up to three gigahertz, I needed to see that there was a nice flat 50 ohm impedance across the entire line. And so, obviously, right angles are going to cause problem because as you see on the right, your impedance, your characteristic impedance that is measured from this simulation, this is a COMSOL simulation where we, where we do finite element analysis of what the, uh, of, of what the impedance is, on the circuit based on, uh, uh, based on the geometry, the physical geometry of the circuit. This goes all over, all over the map for, um, uh, for uh, once you get up to high frequencies, about three gigahertz or so, right where I'm concerned about. So I say, okay, well, KiCad can do chamfered tracks. So if we can stick with chamfered tracks, we're golden. Unfortunately, it's better and it's not a solution. It's better, it gets us most of the way there. If we can accept up to 10% variation in our input impedance, we're okay. But we can't accept 10%, we can only accept about uh, 2% uh, input impedance variation. And so we need, need to get better. And so last, you go to rounded tracks. Rounded tracks, Oh, it's yellow. I should have chose a different color. It's mostly flat across this entire uh, across this entire spectrum. Um, we, we're we're within about a, we're within about a percent over the entire range that we're concerned about. Rounded tracks are better at high frequencies. Doesn't really matter below that. Below below a gigahertz or so, you don't you don't you don't uh, worry about it. But not everyone gets that luxury, and so let's see what we can do to make this happen. So, first, how do, we do, how do we do this? There are three options in KiCad. Option number one, you can just drag your track. A lot of people don't know this, but you can drag your track around a rounded, uh, around a rounded edge. Sometimes it works better than others. So, as an example, here what I'm doing is I'm drawing an edge cut. So you start by draw, drawing your edge cut, and then you, you space the edge right at where you want your track curve to be, and then you draw your track. Now your track is chamfered, but after you complete it, 
you go down and you drag your track, and Tom's auto, <laughs> Tom's push and shove route, what kind of route around that? Uh, and then you delete it afterwards, right? You delete the edge cut afterwards. It's not all that good. <laughs> kind of play with it. So after, after, after you do this and you say, okay, well, okay, once you do that, you can't edit it anymore because now it's, it's 50,000 tiny little, tiny little segments around in, that, uh, around in that edge. So we say, okay, well, that's, that's, that's good if that's all we had, but you know, that's not what we want to do. Option number two, you can draw on the copper plane. Select your front copper. Whoop, that's not option two. Oh, there we go. Draw it on the copper. You can you just select your copper, your copper plane, select the arc tool, and you can just draw it. Right? So problem with this, as we'll see, is that once you once once you do that, you just select your arc tool, make sure that you're on that all your traces are right on your grid lines. I'm not sure why that's flashing. And then you can just you can just draw your tool. Hey, look at that. We've drawn copper. And now you have a nice copper tool. This gets moved around. You can move it around just, uh, just fine. It's only one element in your circuit, but it doesn't notice those rat's nest lines don't go away. So the perfectionist in you says, that's annoying and my DRC is going to complain. So option number three, use a footprint. And this is your solution for today of how you create curve tracks today in KiCad that are DRC compliant and that uh, will, uh, will be contained as a, single, as a single element. You make one pad, one pad per trace and you make a complex shape and you can reuse it. Um, oftentimes in high speed design, you don't need to make every single track. Not every single track is high speed. Right? Your pull-up resistors aren't high speed. You don't want rounded traces on your pull-ups. You want these on your RF lines. And so you can design your traces uh, where you want your curves and then reuse, uh, reuse those curves because you're going to be generally doing two types of curves, 90 degrees and 45 degrees. So make curve footprints. Step number one, you, you open up footprint editor and make some fake tracks because it's easier to, uh, to remember exactly where your tracks are going to be if you make some fake tracks. So I like to put those on the eco layer. Then you, make, you can uh, make your measurements. Always make sure that you have the vertex at zero, zero. One of the vertices needs to be at zero, zero because it makes the math easier. It makes math easier in your head. And then your real tracks or your fake tracks should be the same width as your real tracks. Because what you're going to do is you're going to create this footprint and you want to make sure that it overlaps exactly where you want. So step number two, you make a circular pad because that's, that's the first part of, uh, of any trace. Your size on the circular pad should be the track width. And then you get rid of all the technical layers. Normally footprints will have all of the paste and the solder mask and all the layers checked. You only want a copper. Right, because you want that under your silk, uh, under your silk screen, and then put the position along the uh, uh, along the radius of curvature and one zero uh, uh, along one axis. So in this case, what I've done is I've said the position x is zero, and the position y is my radius of curvature. Now, why is it my radius of curvature? Because the radius of curvature is the center of the arc. And so that defines how far it is from the center to the trace. And so if you, if, if you make your desired radius of curvature uh, to be the, one of your X or Y positions, you'll always get your uh, arc in the right spot. Now, to make this even easier for you, make your grid an even divisor of, um, of, of the radius. So it's always going to be on 0, 0 because you put your traces on 0, 0. And so you make your grid to be an even divisor and you can just use the grid snapping to get your arc in the right spot. Now the next thing you're going to do is you're going to draw an arc on your copper layer. So we draw an arc on the copper layer, one, two. So here I've drawn one arc, two arcs on, uh, on, the, uh, on the copper layer. And I have, two, um, I have two pads so far. Next, we're gonna duplicate those pads around, right? So now I have four pads, but only two numbers. So if it's on the same trace, it needs to be on the same net. 
if you want your net list to work out correctly. So both of the, tr uh, both of the pads that are on net one, both have the same pad number, both of the pads that are on net two, both have the same pad number, and then I have a copper trace going in between them. Now, pick those two out and merge them. So if you select both, uh, both traces, or excuse me, if you select one pad and the, uh, and the copper arc, you can merge those now into a complex pad shape. You cannot use two pads. You only use one pad. So not quite perfect, but you know, we're, 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 we're getting there. So, so now one pad is a complex, and the other pad of the same pad number is going to be just a simple pad. And you can connect traces to both sides of the same net. So, and here is the magic sauce. You want to add your pad to die length into this pad, or into, uh, in, into, each, pad, uh, into each pad separately. KiCad supports implementing a, a, a length of the pad where it's supposed to be the length from the edge of the thing into the die. But here we're going to use it as the length of the trace all the way along the arc. And very easy in KiCad because you can input a formula. So use pi, 3.14159. Now it's a, it's, a, it's a 90 degree arc. So it's one quarter of a full circle. Full circle's two pi, so we're going to be uh, two pi radius over four and put that, in, put that into, your, uh, into your pad length. And now your calculations of the net length in PCB new are going to be accurate. And this is very important in high speed because you need to match your net lengths. So add, add, add that in and you get, uh, you get that for you know, more or less free. Now, 45 degree arcs are a little bit more difficult and require some geometric. Um, so first step in a 45 degree arc is again drawing the fake traces, and here I'm going to just kind of label a few things so it's obvious how this goes. First, the radius of curvature is R here, and so Pythagorean theorem is going to tell you that your, uh, that your length of the triangle there is R over root two, right? Because A squared, B squared, C squared sort of thing. So that's going to be R over two, and we have a known, I'm going to start with a known height above here. So I, so I put in a known y. You can pick a known r and go that way. Uh, here I picked a known y. You have to pick one or the other. Now, notice that a 45 degree track has a slope of 1. So you get uh, the, the, uh, the calculation for that, si for that light blue line by using this fact, by saying that both of the legs of the triangle are the same width. So we're going from the point of intersection of the 45 degree track up to the verte vertex of the two tracks. That's r minus r over two, or r over root two. Which gets us our solution. So here, now that we have that, we can say, okay, what's our x and what's, uh, what's our x and what's our y and what's our radius of curvature? So we end up with two formulas and you can just, you know, you'll see these slides afterwards if you uh, don't want to remember the derivation, you kind of get up there, ooh, 10 minutes. So um, now, uh, both of those are today. Tomorrow, hopefully, uh, eventually, complex pads get splines. Um, this will, uh, th this is, so examples of splines here I needed to match the trace width of the, uh, of, of the input lines, and it wasn't really an arc problem because I would have needed to do one, two, three, four arcs in order to get that in there. Splines make it a lot easier, and so uh, adding Bezier splines um, gets a lot easier there. But what about splines today? Can we use splines in KiCad today? Turns out. 5.1, the answer is yes. Start in Inkscape, export as a, a spline into DXF, and you can import it into PCB New and edit it to your heart's content. We can't draw them yet, but we can definitely import them. So, um, so this allows you to create some rather complex outlines. 
Uh, this is an example board with, uh, with, with a number of different splines in it, a, a very bendy PCB that uh, needed, I needed to uh, uh, make for a, uh, for, a different, uh, for a different kind of uh, dark matter search. So this was, uh, this, uh, this was implementing uh, splines in that. So one more option, future KiCad coming soon, autocomplete routes. This, um, I built this for this board particular. Um, but it's still ever so slightly buggy, so you haven't seen it in the master code base yet, but you know, coming, coming soon, post route cleaning, length matching, and differential pair routing. So let's see, we'll see if the video works. So you select, select the routes that you want to, uh, that you want to auto-complete, um, starting size, Optimize the tracks and specify the length for the traces because here I need to make sure that all the traces end up to be the exact same length because they're high-speed high, sp high traces that are going to be uh, used and digitized. And then just let it work. And it goes through initially, segments all of the, uh, all of the lines and then tries to match and optimize. Now I'm showing you, um, uh, I'm showing you the end complete of a uh, of a route here, and each of the uh, each of the lines ends up to be about four point uh, four point four uh, inches in total length, um, give or take uh, about uh, point point five percent, which is kind of hard coded right now. But hopefully in the in the future we'll get uh, get that into the master code base. You can all give it a try out. So thank you. <laughs>